Um, greetings and very warm welcome to the 21st edition of the World Sustainable Development Summit. I'm Priya Malhotra and we are here for the session Women Leadership and Co Our Common Co uh, Future. This session will be moderated by Dr. Vibha Dhawan, Director General Terry and co-moderated by Mr. Shreyas Joshi, a young professional from Terry. On the panel, we are happy to have a very distinguished line of speakers who need no introduction, but to begin with, we have Professor Lawrence Juliana, Chief Executive Officer, European Climate Foundation, Ms. Rachel Kite, Dean Fletcher School, Tufts University, with, uh, uh, Ms. Helen Pradison, Chief Executive Officer, The Climate Group, Ms. Kate Hampton, Chief Executive Officer, Children Investment Fund Foundation, Ms. Mercy Wanja Kaurindutu, Deputy Executive Director, The Green Belt Movement, Ms. Jige Basteta, co-founder of Green Earth Initiative. I would now hand over the session to Dr. Vibha Dhawan to conduct the proceedings of the session. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Ria. Uh, and I'm so happy to be part of this very important session, Women Leadership and Our Common Futures. Tobiana, Chief Executive Officer, European Climate Foundation, Rachel Kite, Dean Fletcher School, Helen Clarkson, CEO of Climate Group, Kate Hampton, CEO of Children Investment Fund Foundation, Ms. Mary Vanja, and Ms. Bestida. Hearty welcome to all of you. And I'd also like to welcome the participants to this session. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development rightly calls for ensuring women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision making in political, economic, and public life. Women being and compassionate, uh, they also have an innovative way of thinking, organizing, and leading. I do remember, like in one of the HR programs, it was said that how the women handle the same situation differently. And they gave one example that both men and uh, both the uh, uh, wife and husband, they are holding very high positions. And one fine day, there was a message that the child had met with an accident, that how the two handles the same situation. For men, it was, he just, because he was entering the meeting, so he gave to his secretary and said, you keep the phone. If there is something very, very urgent, then only disturb me. And the same message when he reached his wife, she immediately said to her subordinate, you take care of the meeting. I'm just rushing to take care of my son because he might be needing me more than what I'm required over here. But definitely I'm on the phone and you can reach me if there is some important decision to be taken over here. And that is what also happens, I should say, in our day to day life, because somewhere the women feel that they are more responsible for their families. But I don't say that it is their weakness or it is the problem of any kind. It's not because essentially I'll say that they are blessed with this unique ability of multitasking. So it is also like I can say for my country at least, it is that that when the husband comes home and he's tired, it is taken as you had a tough day, please relax. But the woman, when she reaches home late, it is somewhere she feels guilty. I, I have neglected my house. I don't know what is in your respective countries. But at the same time, let's look into what is it that we can do. And especially in post COVID scenario, because post COVID or what we have faced in last two years is that, first of all, there is now a fear. COVID can come back anytime. Second, people have started working from home and therefore there is also somewhere a sort of reluctance. Do we really need to go to office to work? And third is that we have also become more responsible for our environment. Uh, not just, it's not just COVID, it is what we have faced 
in last couple of years because earlier we were saying climate change is a threat but now we know that it's a reality whether it is floods in germany new york hurricanes cloud bursts in different parts of india and so on so therefore women also have this responsibility or leadership that inspires and enables the next generation the scenario has totally changed it it is no more dictate or direct or dictate it is basically that you have to take everyone with you and also understands their problems and be more caring towards their own colleagues and their families and so on i think everyone sharing this virtual stage today would, would agree these virtues are very much ingrained in femininity thus the world looks up to its phenomenally phenomenal women for an effective and creative response to environmental issues that the world is facing today and to contributes to saving our planet and, and ensuring that we hand over a livable and safe world to our future generations and again if you look at how the societies have changed over years few years back in many of the developing countries it was mere survival asia africa it was how do you ensure that there is no more hunger or we are still challenged with uh, in some parts of the world we still have that but then we have also moved to a consumeristic society so there again we have to bring back or we have to engrave these values of reuse recycle and use minimum as much as possible and there again we have lots of responsibility i feel very fortunate and we are very privileged to have such an esteemed lined up women leaders in this session who will bring a wealth of experience to the table and now i request co moderator shreyas joshi a young professional at tel to lay before you the key issues for your valuable insights so over to shreyas and thank you very much to all of you looking forward to very active participation and new ideas thanks once again thank you ma'am um, a very hearty good evening to everyone here uh, as is evident i am the only male in this panel of immensely accomplished speakers who each of who is a stalwart in their respective fields however i assure you that my position as a response is here as that of a responsible and involved stakeholder this is an exciting opportunity for me as a young professional to listen learn understand and more importantly develop my sensibilities towards the experiences of women my hope through this session is for this and the future generations to learn and be more inclusive and for the older generation to work towards creating a more accommodating environment moving ahead one of our biggest fallacies in gender and climate discourse has been that of either elevating people to the status of heroes or relegating them to that of being mere victims this dichotomy perhaps often leads to the blurring of nuances and uniqueness that a uh, uniqueness of gendered experiences that exist even within the female identity uh recognizing recognizing the independent agency leader and leadership of women is very important especially uh, to bring to mainstream it into the gender and climate action discourse thus through this session in, in uh, with the presence of such wonderful speakers i would like to have a fruitful discussion on women leadership in the global south leveraging positions of power to bring forth voices from the ground and how inclusive policies can be made with the help of women leaders so, uh, that, so that we can have more informed Uh, voices from the ground uh so i'd like to start discussion with uh, 
Ms. Lawrence Trubiana, Chief Executive Officer, European Climate Foundation. Professor Trubiana is a CEO of the European Climate Fund and Professor at Sciences. Before Paris, before, before joining ECF, uh, Ms. Trubiana was France's Climate Change Ambassador and Special High represent Representative for COP21. Following COP21 and through COP22, she was appointed UN High Level Champion for Climate Action. The stage is yours, ma'am. Thank you very much and thank you for this very interesting and, um, you know, a provocative invitation because uh, at, what, at the same time, many people are talking about uh, women leadership and women inclusion. And at the same time, we know that we are lagging behind in so many fields, in so many countries, in so many processes. So it's good to recall that we are not there, uh, even if uh, a lot have been proven that there was a lot to be learned from women lead leadership. Uh, and as, as um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Vibra said, the COVID crisis shows that women leaders have performed much, much better. Uh, in during the pandemic, just thinking about New Zealand, uh, Finland, Taiwan, etc. So uh, the proof is in the pudding in a way, and it has been demonstrated. Not at the time, nevertheless, um, there is still, of course, um, uh, we are lagging behind in, in many, many fronts. Non coincidentally, several of the same countries have also demonstrated considerable leadership in the climate field in recent years. A good example again is New Zealand, which has placed sustainable development at the center, including on the trade uh, and diplomatic activities. So uh, again, demonstration is there. And we have seen more on the rebellious uh, uh, front, the young women like Vanessa Nakate, Greta Thunberg, Yuna Maret, leading climate mobilization and calling the government uh, and making and, and asking them to be really accountable in front of the new generation. So from the street to parliament and assemblies, they are speaking out with a great determination that should inspire everybody. But unfortunately, this actual leadership uh, is not reflected in the formal treaty process, for example. Just for example, taking the example of UNFCCC, only 33% of UNFCCC delegates are women. And it's much worse when you look at the heads of delegation, not speaking about ministers. Every day, women's leadership show exactly what the Paris Agreement vision to include non-state actors was important. And I see Ellen that has been so active in the really mobilizing the, uh, the, the cities and the regions. Um, more representation of different actors but also more representative of women. And that's what makes the agreement more resilient, better equipped to tackle all the dimensions of the climate crisis. Don't forget, the politics can have very detrimental effect on the climate action. And if you don't have a solid base, a solid constituencies with women as well, very active, we can have really a backlash from on many fronts. Today, women are also better represented in youth movement and local communities who are carrying the norms of the Paris Agreement into their countries and community, from Operation Libero to NOSAS, from Sunrise to Friday for Future, all are led by women. But we must continue, and this, this mobilization where uh, being inclusive, trying to fight for justice, so values that normally everybody should share. We must continue to promote ecofeminism. Sometimes uh, people see that it's not a, a good combination of the two, but we we have to see that the 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 mobil it's not the particular perception that the women would have, but the capacity to mobilize and the capacity to fight and a central as a central way of understanding climate change and climate action. This means a better understanding of women's perspective in climate action a better understanding as well of how physical impact of climate disproportionately affect women. The impact of climate change reinforces existing social inequality, we know that, which means women are more affected, same for vulnerability to conflict, etc. So again, no, no need of very detailed demonstration, it's happening all, every day. Where women, as it's often the case, are the prime of actual workers, 
Climate change is leading and will lead to a shortage of arable land and a drop in their incomes. The physical impacts of climate, the floods, the droughts, the storms, the deforestation, accelerated urbanization, crop failures, lower yields and higher food price, everything is affecting more women. So according to the UN, this situation explains why the risk of death in a natural disaster is 14 times more higher for women than men. It just, I think this number is incredible. 75% of environmental refugees today are women who become susceptible to violence and other forms of exploitation. Too often they lack the resources and knowledge to deal with that. This course extends to and interacts with other forms of inequality, such as race, class, health, and disability. And it also applies to wealthier countries, not only to the more vulnerable countries. One example, pregnant women are particularly sensitive to problems caused by air pollution, with cross impact for demographic groups residing in urban centers. So the way to break these structural patterns is by working to create new ones, ones where women are structurally represented in the decision-making process at all levels. A study realized on 130 countries suggests that those with a higher number of women in parliament are more likely to ratify environmental treaties. And another study ran across 90 countries all over the world suggests that those with higher number of women in parliament tended to protect land areas at higher rates. So the solution is here, but of course the system is, is, is of course resisting the change. But I think it's very good to join forces to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful remarks, ma'am. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the the fact that you brought in uh, about understanding the impacts that uh, women face due to climate change and uh, generating more awareness and having policies made to to bring in more inclusivity and voices from women. I would now like to call to the stage uh, Ms. Rachel Kite, Dean Fletcher School, uh, Tufts University. Ms. Rachel Kite is the fourth, 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Prior to joining Fletcher, uh, Ms. Kite served as Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General and CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. She previously was the World Bank Group's Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change. The stage is yours, ma'am. Thank you very much, and thank you for this uh, invitation to this very important event. And um, I'm glad to be able to be with you virtually, and I hope that we will be together in person some point in the future. It's always very uh, difficult to follow uh, Laurence, um, but I think that uh, we, we stand on each other's shoulders, and that is one characteristic of the women's leadership that the world needs at the moment. So I'm going to try to weave together a, a, a number of different threads, uh, which I think are important, um, both looking back and looking forward. This year, we're going to celebrate 50 years of the Stockholm uh, Environment Conference, really the first time that the international community came together and looked at the environment as an issue for international cooperation in, the true, in a true multilateral sense. And I was recently speaking to the biographer of um, uh, Shirley Temple Black, who many people just thought of as a child, uh, child film star, but who went on to have an illustrious diplomatic career. And in her diaries and her memoirs, she records what it was like to be uh, a woman uh, involved in the run-up to Stockholm and the Stockholm Conference at a time when there were so few women there, although the leadership statement was, of course, authored by Margaret Mead and Barbara Ward. Um, and so as a woman, uh, she was invited to go off to a side room and have lunch with the wives, uh, perhaps do some sightseeing, things like this. And I've reflected on this because I started my career in 1992, uh, my international environment career, as it were, uh, when uh, Bella Abzug and a group of women, including Wangari Matai and, and others from around the world, Ellen Enge from Norway and so many others, basically barnstormed their way into the negotiations for the United Nations um, Environment Development Summit, uh, UNSAID, or Rio, uh, the Rio Conference, um, and had to sort of jam their foot in the door of the text negotiations. And sort of at one point, 
uh, add the phrase and women and children to every set, every paragraph just to get to the point where we could actually negotiate uh, what sustainable development meant um, from a gender perspective and what the implications of sustainable development and positive and negative would be for, for, for women. From that moment on, I think we've seen extraordinary uh, activism uh, by women across the globe pushing back at the boundaries of how we understand sustainable development and how it lands differently um, uh, for, for women and for, for men and for children within communities. And here we stand now on the 50th anniversary and we've come a long way, but we still have, as Laurent said, uh, a very long way still to go. I would say that some women have burst through the glass ceiling, but many women now stand perched on the glass cliff. What I mean by a glass cliff, well, I think that there's some interesting scholarship now that when a task seems too difficult or too complex, where the possibility of success seems quite remote, then um, institutions, financial institutions, private sector firms, government bureaucracies, cabinets, politicians, political movements will often put a woman in charge. Uh, at the same time, it is fearless women, again, as Laurence referred to, the young women today that strike every Friday and so much more, that have really looked unblinkingly into the future and said, we have to uh, be the change we want to see. I think there are also two other strands of uh, scholarship which are important here. One is the research um, over very long periods of time as to what diversity does to our perspective around risk. So there's been research in management teams, leadership teams, and the implications for uh, private sector institutions, firms, for banks, in including uh, as a result of the great financial crisis more than 12 years ago, that when we have a more diverse team, diversity in this case being uh, gender diversity, that the diversity of perspectives means that we take a more holistic view of risk and we will make different risk decisions. We will have a disparate, different risk appetite within our team. Why is this important? Well, I think this is very important when we look at a um, wicked problem such as climate change or such as biodiversity loss or such as the waste and pollution a crisis that we face. And the fact that we need all of the diversity that we can get in our understanding of risk because we need to at one hand understand how this will impact different uh, members within society differently but also because we need that synthetic view of risk in order to be able to calibrate our response correctly there is a tone deafness to much of our politics and to much of our leadership we know that we haven't made progress in the gender balance within boardrooms or within c-suites of global companies certainly within the financial sector we haven't made progress enough uh, in elected uh, representative chambers um, in parliaments around the world and so if we don't yet have that synthesized view of risk then how are we going to make the right choices and how to move forward and the third piece of scholarship has been around resilience and what makes one community more resilient than another. Some of the interesting research that's come out of Australia, in East Asia, Japan, often in response to extreme weather events, has really focused on the social bonds that exist within a community and how a community with stronger social bonds has more resilience and will actually do better in the teeth of a disaster and then afterwards. Unsurprisingly, one of the factors that increases the strength bonds within the community how we network with each other often surprisingly women that have a mental map within the neighborhood whether it be isolated or dependent on others or children as a fire sweeps through your hand you face tsunami then it is the women who will often informally find, uh, form the social bond that allows that community to not only do better in the teeth of the disaster, but we know that so much of the resilience asset is in women. And when we know that so much diversity of perspective that will give us 
perhaps a, uh, a different view of uh, the, the decisions that we need to make for the future and that that resides, then it is fully extreme to not have a more balanced approach to the literature of our society. Time magazine last year that it's the part that we have uh, uh, sorry for interrupting Ms. Kite. Uh, I think there's some problem with your internet connectivity. We aren't able to hear you properly. Oh, sorry. Well, maybe I'll just uh, I'll just end there and uh, hand the floor. Over. But fifty years talking. Uh, it's a tool now. It's much better now. Well, thank you very much. After the Stockholm Conference, come a long way. We stand on the shoulders of so many women who have forged uh, a pathway for us. Um, and now it is our responsibility to provide strong and broad soldiers for the young women who are on the streets, the young women who are studying at uh, schools like mine and, and Lawrence's and around the world and open the door for them and which means that as there's a special responsibility I think for our generation of women and there's a special responsibility for men to lift women up and lift young men up, men up with an expectation that only working together uh, will we find the reciprocal vulnerability in the leadership we need. Reciprocal vulnerability is the idea that um, we can as leaders indicate that we don't have all of the ideas but that we will find them together in teams or in cross-sectoral dialogue or between countries and that in that reciprocal vulnerability in, in allowing yourself as a leader to say I don't have all the answers but I'm going to find them together with you that you open up avenues for more social trust I think the one thing that we've learned from COVID and the one thing that we're learning from the climate crisis is that we need to build back social trust because communities with more social trust do better through these crises and I think that women's leadership will be fundamental to that Thank you very much. Thank you for your insightful comments, uh, Ms. Kite. I really enjoyed uh, the three uh, topics that you brought to the place. For instance, the glass cliff, the idea around uh, bringing in more diversity to have policies that understand, the, uh, that help us synthesize risk appetite, also resilience, and of course, reciprocal vulnerability, as you mentioned. I would now like to hand over the stage to Ms. Helen Clarkson, Chief Executive Officer of the Climate Crew. Ms. Clarkson joined the Climate Group in 2017 and, and is its Chief Executive Officer. In addition to leading the growing Climate Group team, Ms. Helen Clarkson sits on the board of the V-Mean Business Coalition. The stage is yours, ma'am. Thank you and thanks. I'd like to add my thanks to uh, Terry for inviting me in the World Sustainable Development Summit and what a great uh, pleasure it is to be here amongst this fantastic group of people and you know if you're building a really impressive climate conference lineup with the top speakers of the world regardless of gender I think all these women would be on the list so I just want to say it's not the list of the top women in climate but you know the top people here uh, and I want to thank all of them for the work that they do and, and everything that their work inspires but we're here to talk about diversity and so i think the first question for me when looking at this is why diversity should be a goal in the climate space i know everyone here today and listening to this would agree it's morally the right thing to do but i think it's also the thing that's necessary to create the change that we need at the pace that we need it you know when you think about diversity problems i always kind of think about silicon valley and um, being called out on that there's this monoculture of move fast and break things that we know attracts a particular type of white male uh, and they're sometimes excused by tech companies on the ground that you know startups need to solve urgent problems and you know it's time consuming to learn to work with colleagues from different backgrounds so we're just gonna go like this and i think you could you know, possibly argue the same thing in the climate space. We know that we're running out of time. We've got to halve emissions in this decade to get on a path to net zero by 2050. So surely it's just, you know, why waste time on this other stuff? But, you know, as we've seen with Silicon Valley, complex problems need 
multifaceted solutions and hiring a monoculture means that when you're confronted with a problem, similar people reach for similar solutions. And there's a great thought experiment um, that I think explains this really well. It's called the catch up question. And I think it really kind of gets into why diversity matters. So if you're in the United States, you probably keep your ketchup in the fridge. Um, but in the UK, and I understand also in India, we tend to keep our ketchup in the cupboard. So one day you go along to eat your fries, you reach into the cupboard or fridge and you've run out of ketchup. What do you get? What do you lay your hands on? In the US, the nearest thing to where your ketchup was is going to be the mayonnaise. But if you're in the UK, then it's brown sauce. Um, in, the India, in India, pudina chutney. So if you only hire people who keep their ketchup in the fridge, the answer to your problem is always mayo. And it's similar if you, if you hire just the cupboard people. But if we hire one of each, we've now got three solutions to the same problem. Mayo, brown sauce, pudina chutney. We are trying to address a much, much bigger problem here than how to make our fries tasty. We're tackling the biggest issues of our time, but people with the same experience and backgrounds are often going to reach for the same conclusions. Essentially, they're all reaching for the mayonnaise. If we're going to respond to the sector to these huge challenges ahead of us, then diversity is not just a box ticking exercise, but an essential measure to improve our sector's ability to see problems and see solutions from as many perspectives as possible. So I personally first made the connection between women's health and the climate and climate change when I was working in the Democratic Republic of Congo for Médecins Sans Frontières. We were working with women who'd been victims of sexual violence during the war. And this was a few years later. That's when we managed to get in there and get a clinic open. And so people were presenting quite late, you know, compared to when these things had happened to them. So they had some ongoing mental and physical health problems, but their big problems were actually economic because this had put them into a situation where it was making it hard for them to earn a living. And that was then made worse um, during a bad rainy season when farming was even more affected. So you could just see right in front of you economic problems, driving health issues, and this kind of classic sustainability connection, the triangle, you know, health, the environment, the economy. And we know that weather is only going to make that more, that the weather is going to be more uncertain as the climate change, and that spiral is going to get worse, not better. And that's, of course, well documented. It's what people are talking about, I think, when they say the climate crisis is worse for women. But we also have a fundamental role in solving it. And as I talked about before, the world needs every type of solution we can bring along. So one of the questions um, I was asked about for this speech is what kind of platform is needed, needs to be created to address the four types of barriers to leadership and empowerment for women. So structural barriers, institutional mindsets, individual mindsets and life choices. So I want to sort of run through um, those. Structurally, there's one big answer, which is education. It's been mentioned, I think, already, and it's going to no doubt be brought up again. But educating girls is, according to research carried out by Project Drawdown, one of the five most powerful levers available for avoiding emissions. Women with more years of education have fewer and healthier children, and they actively manage their reproductive health. Educated girls realise higher wages and greater upward mobility, contributing to economic growth. And their agricultural plots are more productive and their families better nourished. And education also shores up resilience and equips girls and women to face the impacts of climate change and can be more effective stewards of food, soil, trees, water, even as nature's um, cycles change and get greater capacity to cope with shocks from natural disasters and extreme weather events. Today, there are economic, cultural and safety related barriers that impede 62 million girls from around the world from accessing education. That is a tragedy on such a huge scale. And we also need to see changes in the, not just the uptake of higher education, but what women are studying and specializing in when and if they get to university. We need to get women, people of color, working class people studying science, technology, engineering, and maths. Without the knowledge and skills, they aren't going to be equipped to deal with the problems we face. And so there's a breadth of issues right across the education space. And we know that's a matter of urgency. When it comes to the next thing, institutional mindset, we know change is really hard. So changing company policy is a huge part of what we do at Climate Group. We're known, I think, for um, a lot for our business initiatives. So RE100, uh, EV100, EP100. And as we're getting companies to join those, we often 
we really never make the case uh, you know, based on morals. We don't talk that much really about the climate crisis. We often go straight in and focus on the business case. We talk about the money it would save them, the fact that green solutions work better. We talk about PR benefits, the risks of not doing it, including not being able to attract talent. We talk about leadership. And I think this is the same approach we need to take on diversity. So Rachel mentioned some of the research, um, some UK research last year, the Financial Reporting Council showed that higher levels of gender diversity in the FTSE 350 boards positively correlate with better future financial performance. And that FTSE 350 boards with well-managed gender diversity contribute to higher stock returns and are less likely to experience stakeholder, uh, shareholder dissent. So if we want to see action at the speed we require in institutions that don't really see the need for change on diversity or on the climate, as we're discussing here, we need to always come back to that business case. And finally, we come to individual action and life choices. And we're very hesitant to talk about these at the climate group because we think they're often a way of distracting from the big systemic changes that are needed. We do need individual action, both in climate crisis and regards to diversity. But while the sort of systems are stacked against us, individual actions are not going to get us there on their own. So, you know, do that work because you want to, but bring your energy and your power to dismantling the organisational and structural issues that we face. Uh, women make up half our population and yet we waste so much of the potential. But that's true also of people from different classes, different races, different castes. We need diversity in every form to address this crisis. So looking at those speaking today, I'm optimistic that we're going in the right direction, but it's clear that we've got a lot more to do. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, ma'am. Um, I really appreciate the idea of structural change by bringing in education. I think it's really important to educate not just women, but also men so that they realize the, the, the criticality of diversity and how bringing these, bringing diverse people to the group. Like you said, the example of uh, tomato, mayo and pudina chutney. I think it's really important that we bring in diversity for bringing in more inclusive policies in place. Um, I would now like to uh, hand over the floor to Ms. Kate Hampton, Chief Executive Officer, Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Ms. Hampton became CEO of CIF in March 2016, having run CIF's climate change team since 2009. Uh, her career spans roles in government, finance, consulting, think tanks, NGOs, including at Climate Change Capital, where she was head of policy. She has also advised policymakers in several roles, including as senior policy advisor for the United Kingdom's G8 and EU presidencies in 2005. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thanks very much. And it's been uh, really interesting listening to the, the conversation so far. So I will probably skip through the bits that have been well covered by those ahead of me and, and give more time to those from other parts of the world that will have, again, probably more diversity um, in, in, their, in their thinking. Um, Children's Investment Fund Foundation uh, works on both uh, climate and gender. Um, and as the world's largest children's foundation, we obviously take the perspective of children and young people uh, when addressing these problems. And I think many people on the platform have already talked about um, what is leadership um, and both in terms of old power and new power, um, there is um, plenty of women's leadership uh, already and in fact there's plenty of evidence that where there are, are women in leadership positions um, outcomes are better um, and we've also heard about the importance of diversity in innovation um, and solution creation um, and if we're trying to create a net zero world which has never been created before we're going to need a lot of innovation but not just tech innovation social innovation business innovation political innovation governance innovation um, and so on We've also heard about youth and the power of youth and the power of young women. Um, SIF has uh, been working with young people around the world on both sexual reproductive health and rights, girls education, um, climate change and clean air. And there is no question that young people bring their lived experience to their leadership. 
um, and new solutions um, um, to the fore whenever they are given share of voice. And even when they're not given share and voice, they, they innovate in their own communities. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that nothing should be done for young people without young people in the room. Uh, young people are not uh, instruments of intervention. Young people are leaders, they are agents of change, um, and um, they have lived experience that should be um, taken into account. In terms of the impacts, we've also heard quite a lot about the impact of COVID on women um, and children. Um, like all shocks, it is it is women and children that are adversely affected. Um, COVID across our programs, we have seen increased incidents in women being excluded from school. Uh, women are often the first to lose their jobs. Um, we've seen an increase in gender based violence, child marriage, trafficking, um, all of these things disproportionately affecting women and girls. Similarly, climate change, the same increases in child marriage in extreme weather events you know, the burden of water collection that falls upon women in many um, low income communities uh, becomes harder and takes them away from other things and increases their vulnerability to gender based violence. And all of these things are interconnected. We hear the phrase intersectionality a lot. Um, and yet much of the world continues to design um, uh, solutions in silos. Um, and this is because we don't put the women and girls at the heart of decision making um, and see the world from their perspective. And yet this is um, this is crazy, even from a pragmatic perspective, as, as, as Helen and others were saying, investment in women and girls and investment by women and girls is actually going to accelerate um, our recovery uh, and our resilience. Uh, investment in women and girls, um, we've heard the examples of the amazing force multiplier that is girls' education. Um, SIF has been investing in keeping girls in school, keeping them out of marriage, enabling their transition to work, providing them with the life skills and control of their own fertility. Um, this breaks the intergenerational cycle of poverty in a way that nothing else does. Uh, as we've heard, uh, educated uh, uh, mothers are able to better provide for their children. So it is an issue of rights, but it's also an issue of pragmatism and it's an in issue of, of, of economic prosperity. An investment by women and girls, and this comes to um, one of the final points I wanted to make because so much has already been said that doesn't need repeating. But we often don't value the right things. Our current economic model is very extractive. Um, externalities such as unpaid women's labor, the social capital that Rachel was describing that is so crucial uh, for resilience, externalities are also environmental destruction, the nature um, that we all um, want to protect. The fact that these things are externalities in, in the current economic system show us that we are not valuing the right things. We need to invest in asset classes that women and girls um, can lead and direct. We need to invest in uh, restoration activities, community activities, improving air in cities, um, these are all the kinds of investments that, that communities are already engaged in um, and they need much more attention um, as asset classes that will help with recovery um, and resilience. So what is recognized as value, as we've heard, is different when women are in the room. What is recognized as risk, we've already heard, is different when women are in the room. And, and the assessment of value and of risk is going to be crucial in solving climate change. So I'm very much looking forward to the other panelists rather than repeating stuff that was already said. Um, but we have so many examples at Children's Investment Fund Foundation of projects where climate and gender are intersecting in new ways and where putting women and girls at the center of design, of policies, of programs, of investments leads to multiplier effects that are not usually seen in these very narrow techno-economic vertical interventions um, that have been the history of uh, philanthropy and ODA. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think it's really important to understand the various gender implications that climate change has and um, the way you've put forth this, put, put forth this has been um, really insightful. Uh, 
the fact that our current model economic model is very extractive is itself um i mean the way that we are living in right now as uh, hoping for infinite growth on a finite planet uh is is something that that we really need to think about uh, also the fact that young people should be there when decisions uh, that would affect them are being made is also something that's very important i would now like to uh, hand over the floor to Ms. Mercy Wanja uh, Kurunditu, Deputy Executive Director, the Green Wealth Movement. Ms. Mercy is Deputy Executive Director at the Green Wealth Movement, and currently uh, she's provide, she provides visionary and strategic leaderships to the movement. The floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, um, my name is to thank Terry for this invitation to be part of this uh, leadership forum. And as the head of programs, I am honored to be sharing the Green Belt Movement integrated landscape approach to empowering communities, restoring degraded landscapes, and improving livelihoods using tree planting as entry point. A Green Belt Movement grassroots experience a nature-based solution to light degradation and community-based community resilience building. Uh, like many have said, uh, my, the speakers who came ahead of me, it is now uh, generally agreed that climate change poses one of the greatest challenges facing the world today. The experience in Africa and in Kenya specifically indicates that women, youth, and children especially are the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. This is because they are in charge of most of the domestic and livelihood activities. There is therefore need here at the Green Belt Movement and globally for innovative strategies and practices to alleviate poverty and ensure survival in the face of climate change. So here at the Green Belt Movement, we work with uh, grassroots women. Our focus is to empower women. And we do this by roping and networking with key stakeholders so that we are able to promote these strategies and practices uh, to address our climate change challenges. Advocacy is a flagship project for the Green Belt Movement. We do a lot of advocacy to rally support for natural resources protection and conservation, and also hold leaders accountable. Uh, and for, we advocate for community and women engagement, especially in decision-making. Uh, we promote gender mainstreaming to ensure their participation and also inclusion. We also lobby and network with the private sector. We have a lot of resources to support nature-based uh, enterprises that can empower the women that we work with economically. At rally stakeholder support, we organize multi-stakeholders forum with diverse stakeholders who are able to interrogate, to interrogate, to interrogate issues and opportunities. And uh, last year we went to Rwanda to help them to, to, inter uh, to interrogate and revise and look into their revised NDC so that they can understand what their priorities are. We also have a community-based measurement reporting and a verification system uh, that enables carbon emission measurement at a household level. These are ways that empowers women to be able to contribute and to know how they are contributing to reducing and increasing emissions. What are the challenges that we are facing at the grassroots? Most of them are around lack of finances, uh, to scale up a uh, local solution that can help the, the women that we work with, lack of training and capacity building on climate change issues. We all know that climate change issues are highly technical. Uh, they need to be unpacked. Most of the document that we have uh, for adaptation for, for the action plans, they are highly uh, technical and they need to be unpacked. And we make uh, user manuals for the, for the women that we work with. And again, access to information. They need to, to understand what is happening. So information sharing is critical. We also have patriarchal societies uh, where men call the shot. 
and we empower the women to have leadership skills for them to be able to fit in the society. Cultural barriers in Africa are very uh, around and we need to, to keep empowering the women so that they can be able to, to break through these barriers. Uh, in terms of creating platforms to address the barriers that we have, uh, that women leadership face, uh, one of the core areas that we work with here in the Digital Movement is an empowerment platform. We have a community empowerment and an environmental education platform to equip the women with skills so that they can make linkages between environment and uh, uh, lifelong improvement. And this is all done through tree planting. Uh, the Green Belt Movement uses a bottom-up approach to environmental conservation to improve the life roads and also uh, empowering the communities so that we start with where the actions are. Uh, where a lot of damages are happening at the grassroots where the women are using the resources that are adjacent to them, especially the forest resources. So empowerment starts at the grassroots, that is the approach we use here at the, at the Green Belt Movement. Again, the most stakeholders forum to, to focus on the behavioral change and mindset, and also to provide alternatives for livelihood options. Indigenous knowledge, again, is a way to bring local solutions and to refine some of the knowledge that we had some time back that was working and has since been forgotten. And also issues around technological transformation to ensure that we bring technologies that will help communities and progress. Uh, in terms of empowering social capital and attracting and retaining advanced women leadership around political and economic issues, uh, empowerment is, is, uh, is key and also experiential learning and the exchange visits for the, for the communities at the grassroots so that they learn from others the best practices, uh, they, they see how others are addressing the challenges. And also we have a package of leadership training to keep equipping uh, these women. In terms of registration in Kenya, we have a Forest Conservation and Management Act uh, that has a component of participatory forest management. Uh, it is able to, to allow women uh, through the CFAs to co-manage the forest resources uh, with the Kenya with the Kenyan forest uh, forestry services. Also, the climate change action plan that is uh, uh, ending this year, they need to be revised. Each one of them has priority uh, mitigation and adaptation actions. And they are very clear where different youth, different gender can engage men, women, children, and youth to support in building our resilience uh, at the grassroots. The involved government here in the country uh, brings resources uh, closer to the people, brings development uh, to, to the communities. And in terms of the norms and, uh, and the paradigm shifts that we are looking into is to break, to break through the cultural norms and the social norms so that we can uh, have a complete gender mainstreaming in the resources management that we promote here in the, in, in the Green Belt movement to ensure that the communities are able to conserve and protect the forest resources that they depend on. And we all believe here that sustainable development cannot be realized without peace, uh, good governance, and environmental resources management. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Uh, I, I really, I, I really appreciate the fact that we all acknowledge the vulnerability that women and children face due to climate change. Also, it's really impressive to hear the work that Green Belt Movement is doing in order to mainstream gender, and uh, uh, you know, mainstream gender to conserve and protect resources in Kenya. I would now like to uh, hand over the floor to Ms. Bastida, co-founder. Re-Earth Initiative. Ms. Bastida is a teenage climate change activist based in New York City and one of the starters of Fridays for Future in New York. She trained youth over the summer of 2019 for the climate march that mobilized over 3 lakh people in New York City. In April 22nd, 2020, she launched Re-Earth Initiative with volunteers from five continents to expand the climate justice movement and educate on how and why pledge for personal and systematic change. 
The floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have listened to such insightful presentations. I, you know, as somebody who is in university right now, I see that there is a future following this path of uh, right, right now climate activism, but in the future, hopefully, I'll be more involved in policy and climate policy. So I just feel so inspired by all of the women who are here to see that uh, this path is possible. Um, my name is Gia Bastida. I am 19 years old and I'm a climate justice activist. I am um, one of the organizers for Fridays for Future in New York City and the co-founder of Re Earth Initiative. And I think a lot of things have been said. And one of the things that I think is very important that we haven't really talked about uh, directly is that much of the reason why women are not included in decision making in locally and internationally is because of our very foundation of international relations, which is based on a framework of realism that um, is a framework that basically says we countries are nations that will go to war with each other for money and power. It's a framework that doesn't center uh, women's leadership, uh, women's perspectives, which are much more sensitive and much more in touch with actual repercussions of uh, countries' actions. And um, I think that when I learned about all of these frameworks of international relations in university, I suddenly understood why the world works the way it does. And it's because uh, ecofeminism, feminism has been pushed out of the conversation for centuries. It's not something that, um, you know, just came out of nowhere. And I think that one of the best things we can do about it is not only include this femi not only this feminism lens, but uh, from my particular perspective, I was born in Mexico uh, as part of the Otomi Toltec indigenous community. My dad is Otomi, my mom is Chilean, and I didn't move to the US till I was 13 years old. So I grew up with this lens of indigenous philosophy where I learned five core principles that I think should be applied to our climate activism and to the way that we uh, interact with each other. The first one is intergenerational cooperation, which is very obvious to me as a youth activist. There is this African proverb that says, uh, the youth run the fastest, but the elders know the path. So that basically says, you know, we are here as youth to push on everything, to push on legislation, to push on suing companies, on suing, on suing governments. We are here to change the curriculum in schools. You know, my school, this is the first time they offer Latinx climate justice as a class, or they offer uh, environmental ethics. And these are very new courses because students have pushed for these. And this doesn't stop at the educational level, at the household level, but it goes all the way to climate conferences and us being at COP26, at COP27 and beyond. Um, so intergenerational cooperation is definitely something that is very prominent in indigenous communities where we have youth and elder circles, where we learn directly from the elders in the community and their wisdom and our story as a community. The next principle is the seven generation principle that I'm sure many of you have heard before. Basically says any decision that we make, we have to look back at the wisdom of seven generations to ensure the stability of the future seven generations. In our current society, we think in quarterly reports, we think of the next semester in school, we think of um, very short term. And if we don't start including the seven generation principle in our policy, you know, we are talking about net zero by 2050, when in reality, net zero means offsets, which in large part are false solutions. Uh, we need much more drastic action, much more attuned action, holistic action. The next um, principle, and this I'm just wording these in terms that are, uh, I think, um, kind of more people will, uh, will uh, understand them and empathize with them. So really act locally and think globally. And with women, this is so important because the youth movement is entirely led by young women around the world. 
I can go anywhere in the world and uh, find youth activists, youth strikers who will take me in as a friend and that has happened time and time again. And the reason why I think this is also very important is because once we start becoming global citizens, once we start going to conferences every year, uh, you know, I've been to two COPs. My first conference, I was 15 years old in Malaysia. We lose touch of our community. We lose touch of what is important. We lose touch of uh, the reality that we have to come back and empower our community to push out that toxic waste dump, to push out that company that is contaminating our aquifer and that's true to me for my town in Mexico. Um, the next principle is reciprocity that has been mentioned before. You know, Earth gives us everything we need to survive and we need to have reciprocal principles to give back. We are taking and taking and that is all that we have been taught to do. And I know that when I first learned about that, I realized that uh, we, there was a, a dissonance, there was a disconnect between how we should behave and how we are behaving. And the last one is cyclicality. Um, as has been mentioned before, we are in a model based on infinite growth and indigenous cultures works, work a lot with sick cycles, cycles of harvest, cycles of you know, it's imaginary as a, an upward spiral. There's still progress, but that progress is cyclical. And when we put our mindset to that, it's a lot easier to understand where we should go and how we should be returning to a lot of the things that we already know. We think that solutions are in the future and it's all about innovation, but without wisdom, those solutions will be empty solutions. Um, so that's all I wanted to share today. I think that um, I just feel very empowered to have heard of so many amazing voices. You know, my parents actually um, met at Rio also, so they met in climate conferences and then uh, I happened about <laughs> 10 years later. Um, and I think that diversity of, you know, we've been talking about diversity, about gender diversity. It's also important to have diversity of backgrounds. And I think the youth movement, because it's we are the most connected generation and the climate movement is the most connected movement that has ever happened because of globalization, because of technology, um, it's important to, to consciously bring in voices that you've never heard before, voices that are not just on you know Western uh, political thought, for example, so that we can challenge ourselves to have uh, a better imagination uh, of the future. Thank you. Thank you for this really energetic, uh, these really energetic remarks. Uh, the five principles that you outlined are perhaps something that should really guide um, the climate discourse and the inclusion of women in the discourse. Also, not forgetting our roots and understanding that there's, it's really important to have actions at the local level because in the end, for every one of us, those adaptations and resilience measures will be really diverse depending on our uh, geographical locations, our socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, I would now like, like to hand over the stage back to uh, uh, Dr. Dhawan, Director General Terry, uh, for uh, her concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Shreyas, and thanks to all the speakers, the esteemed speakers. It was really, I should say, I have learned a lot. Uh, of course, everything, in a way was discussed, but I'll still like to say, and I really like the comment, youth run the fastest, but they, the others know the path. So therefore it is not that it's only youth, which is important for us. Uh, it's also said and very rightly pointed out over here that women's representation in decision-making forums is limited. And in most countries, even when we look at the parliaments or head of the institute somewhere it is that there is less of women representation most recognize they keep on making false promises in terms of that maybe 50 percent of the seats uh, or the, the nominations will be from women but then they keep on struggling with this and it is never done in in fact in india in uh, uh, panchayats that is the rural level institutions it was done 
but uh, that it's only the 50 percent women uh, they will be the panchayat uh, heads but then what was happening over there that they are just the dummies and the decisions were made by their husbands or their father-in-law or others but it has also it has been seen that wherever leader the women have been given leadership role those institutions have done much better we in the government the financial institute engineering everywhere wherever they have been given opportunities they have gone much beyond what others could achieve because if we look at the numbers which are over there then they have done very well com uh, comparatively another thing which was brought out in the discussion and that is uh, about the education which is extremely essential and really speaking education leads to economic independence and that is where they start taking their decision because otherwise if they are not educated they have no power, economic power in their hand and therefore they are dictated by what their husbands tell them in terms of taking financial decisions another thing is that if women have money in the hand they basically they would like to spend on their next generation they are very uh, caring and therefore for them the first priority is that their children should get educated so educating a woman essentially means you are educating a family for the next generation so countries should take note of that but i would also like to bring out that really speaking we also have to upgrade their skill set and over there there is a big problem because they cannot leave their house they will not go for any of the or very little they will be permitted to go and under, uh, undergo some training so that also becomes a problem it's also that women they have to struggle much more they have to prove themselves even in best of the institutes so over there their struggle is much more to get the same level of recognition and even when you are talking generally it is that it is said if someone is driving wrong you'll say it must be a lady driver so somewhere it is engrossed in the mind of most societies that they are fit for softer roles few years back engineering was not even thought or taught of a subject for females and they have proved themselves in engineering so it was true with financial institutions but today if we look at the best analyst in the world financial analysts they are women so it is somewhere that they have to be given opportunity to prove themselves they are the worst sufferer as well when we look at the climate change because what is happening it is that they have to bring water from far off places in terms of food if there are pesticides then in any way if the health of their family is bad they suffer if they have to collect fuel wood or medicinal plants or whatever from the forest resources they have to travel long distances and that in a way leaves very little time available to them to take care of their children and others so they are the worst affected and if we especially look at the greenhouse gas emissions the indoor air pollution again women are the worst sufferer of, uh, of the climate change perhaps the nature based solutions that is what is going to give them improvement and uh, improvement in their life uh, in their lives and especially with the rural, uh, the renewable energy if the energy will be made available in every nook and corner in all the rural parts of the world perhaps they can be engaged in value addition because it's not producing the food it is adding some value so that they can uh, they can get more money and they have better jobs to perform as well and with the migration of men folk to the cities really speaking they are doing the hard jobs as well and as nations most of us are also failing in identifying their role in agriculture if you look at tractors the equipment which is used for agriculture it's all somehow designed to suit male it is not 
light it is not even it just you cannot even make the adjustment in terms of height so it is all made for them and that is again somewhere one will have to work on the another point which i would like to touch upon and that is when we are talking of teaching it is not always degree oriented or we are not really preparing them to go to the corporate world or to the government let's look at education that is more suited to where they are so their education should be more suitable especially the schools and colleges in the rural area they should also tell them what they should do in their everyday life whether it is management of water whether it is in terms of utilizing or making water clean for their use and so on so those things should also be given and i like to close by saying that nutrition is an important component and over there also women is perhaps is the last one to eat in poor families first they serve to their husbands they are after their children and if something is left over that is what they will eat and therefore their health suffers and one can understand that health is wealth and therefore they are not many a times able to contribute uh to the well being of themselves and their families so thank you very much and if any one of you would like to make another point please do that before we close none so thank you once again for yeah ronis you have a point no okay So thank you very much we really 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 enjoyed and look forward to seeing you in person next year thank you thank you